I'd love to win Worlds. I haven't won it yet. It's one of those races that I haven't won that I'd like to. I think it's the ultimate for anyone. You know, I, I don't think you know any other race could be the same as winning a World Championship. In my opinion, I feel like the field here is three to four times more difficult depth-wise than the Hawaii Ironman. Obviously, I want to win it again. It's a very special race to win a world title, and it's very, very important to me to uh, retain it. A medal would be great, and gold medal, I don't really think about it, but uh, that would be awesome. Zealand for the 1994 ITU Triathlon World Championships. We've been following the World Cup Series all season and finally, at the end of a long hard year, this is it, the most important race in the triathlon calendar. Last year, the race was held in Manchester, where a 20-year-old Spencer Smith took the triathlon world by storm with victory in his first ever senior championships. In the women's event, Australia's Michaeli Jones took the gold. She's not here this week, so we'll be looking for a new champion. Nineteen ninety-four has been by far the most important year so far for the sport of triathlon. In Paris on September the fourth, the International Olympic Committee voted to include triathlon on the program for the Sydney Olympics of the year two thousand. And that brings an extra significance to the most important event of this year. The ITU tour began in Japan in May and then followed a grueling schedule to the United States, Europe and South America. Last stop was Ixtapa in Mexico, close to where next year's World Championships will take place. Steve True has been involved with the sport of triathlon for over 12 years, both as a competitor and more recently as a coach. Steve, the development of the sport has been quite extraordinary. It's changed beyond recognition, Matt. It used to be a fun sport that swimmers and runners would do as something extra to their own. Now it's fully professional with 150 elite athletes here. Any one of 20 could win. The organisation is superb with the ITU. It's different. It's a different game. What about the conditions here today in Wellington? Because in fact, they're far from ideal. Conditions are tough, really tough. The wind's gusting at 30 mile an hour, maybe more. The cycle course is tough, it's cold, but it goes with the job. They're professionals, there's a professional job to do. The attitude is right, they'll just get out there and get on with it. Weather conditions in Wellington can be unpredictable. In the southern hemisphere, it's known as the Windy City. The conditions are pretty much similar to the ones in Manchester, and I think it is a, an advantage to me, obviously, because I went so well in Manchester. Uh, I think uh, with the cold water, it's not a problem for me. I think it's going to be a problem for the guys who like the, you know, the heat and the, the other stuff like that, but for me, it's not a problem. If it's choppy like it is today, um, I think I have an advantage because it gets harder and the swimming uh, gets slower. And, well, the cold water, I think it's a mental thing too. I tried it out yesterday and, you know, you just have to keep in mind everybody has to go through this and, of course, it feels uncomfortable, but I don't know, you must be professional about it. On race day, as the athletes gathered at the start, conditions were indeed breezy and getting cooler by the minute. The swim start, unusually, was in deep water, so the athletes needed to be at the start line early. For the regular racers on the ITU tour, this was the biggest challenge of them all. Greetings, world. As you can see, the weather conditions are far from perfect. The water temperature is hovering around 16 degrees, and there's a brisk headwind heading out onto those first five kilometers of the bike. The athletes will be wearing long sleeve wetsuits, and many of them have neoprene hoods on as well. But the cold water will take its toll. 
something as simple as uh, snapping up the bike helmet and putting the bike shoes into the pedals becomes a real problem. However, these are seasoned professionals and they know that they have to put all that aside and concentrate on the task at hand. The swim course is in Lambton Harbour, in front of downtown Wellington. As usual, a kilometre and a half. The bike course leads them out onto the highway, which has been closed to all traffic for the day of the race. 40 kilometres. And finally, the 10 kilometre run. Two laps along Oriental Parade. So the men gathered in the deep water, getting cold. It's a mere 16 degrees. The helicopter shot shows us the thousands and thousands of people who have gathered from all over the North Island come to see this race, which is the biggest sporting event to happen in New Zealand this year. And away they go. The cannon signals the start. The 1994 ITU World Triathlon Championships is underway, and the elite men's group set off on their 1.5-kilometer swim. Alongside me is Steve True. Steve, it's going to be a survival of the fittest and the strongest here. It's going to be one of the toughest races of the season. We've got all the main players, Miles Stewart, Spencer Smith is back, Brad Bevan in fantastic form, and a few newcomers, a few people who might just upset. Benjamin Sansor, we saw his brother Jerome at the Nice Long Course World Championships this year, and Benjamin swims just as well, and in fact it is Benjamin out in front. He's already getting away from the pack, and this really isn't something we see very often in this class of competition. Now Sanson is known to have swum 17 minutes for the one and a half kilometers. Whether or not he can match that here in difficult conditions remains to be seen but he is a very strong swimmer he's likely to be caught on the bike but if he can open up a big enough margin as indeed he appears to be doing here on the swim then he's really going to put down the challenge to the re remainder behind him now some of them are getting on the wrong side of the line there there's a, a whole line which leads out to the first turn boy and they'll have to duck under that when they come to the big yellow marker which signals the first turn there I wonder if this gives an appreciation of just how difficult the conditions are. We're seeing these swimmers actually being pushed over to the side, and as they're approaching that first yellow boy there, it's really going to be very, very hard for the guys that we can see on the left to come underneath. Currently in second place, the American who was second in the opening race of the season, Nate Lorandi. The cold water um, could adversely affect a lot of people. It's going to depend on... Um, what people do in preparation for the race. For example, I'm not going to get in the water until the race starts, and that way I will not be affected by the cold nearly as long as somebody who decides to get in 20 minutes before the race starts. Randy going through his tactics at the start of this race, it seems to be paying dividends. You can discount the swim, really, of Sanson because he's so far ahead of the others in the water and in terms of his ability as a swimmer. Lorandi is holding on to second place, but with him, as expected, are Smith, Bevan, Hobson's up there, and of course, Miles Stewart, the Australian. There's the lead that Sanson has, and it's significant. He'll be out of the water some 10 or 15 seconds ahead of the others. He's on the final stretch as he approaches the steps in front of Lambton Quay. A difficult transition for the athletes. They've got to come up here. It's a, a left turn into transition area. They need to show their numbers to hand in the timing tags. And Sanson really does have an incredible lead there. I don't think we've seen anything like this in any of the ITU races this season. When we saw Jerome Sanson in Nice, he was really having the same sort of tactics. He was trying to get away from the field, not being able to make the break, letting them come back to him, then pushing on ahead. But we're seeing Benjamin here, and he really is a long, long way in front. What a fabulous feeling to get into that transition area entirely by yourself. Now, the clock is ticking away on the bottom left of your screen, and that is the time difference between Sanson and the second-place man, and we'll confirm who that is, because there's a whole bunch of them coming out together, but it looks to me like it's Nate Lorandi. Yes, it is. There's Lorandi arriving to take his wetsuit off. He hands in his timing tag, which is a barcoded system, which is for the judges to confirm who's finished and who hasn't, and Lorandi makes his way now to his bike. Remember, the next stage, 40 kilometres. Well, just behind Lorandi, we can see Spencer Smith there and then his nemesis this year, Brad Bevan. These are the two guys who really want to take this world championship. Bevan's been there always. He's never won a world. Spencer's had a bad season by his standards, but he desperately needs to defend this championship successfully. Sonson is out of transition and on his way, and the others are still putting on their helmets and collecting their bikes. Now there's a big rush to get out of transition. Lorandi's there. Spencer Smith is there. 
There's the Australians. That's Brad Bevan, the World Cup champion already. Without a world title, this is the one that means so much to Bevan. And he's right in there with a good chance at the moment. He leaves transition in third or fourth. Bevan is number 72. Number 77 behind him is Locke Volmerhaus. We last saw him on the ITU tour in Sion in Switzerland. And that's the leading group out of transition. There's Miles Stewart, former world champion. He's been out with injury. He's back and he means business here and he's not far behind the leaders. Stewart out of transition quickly. A lot of pride at stake for the Australians. Bevan, Stewart, great rivals. They've raced all over the world many, many times. Each of them wants it today. There's the number one Frenchman, Philippe Fattori, currently in fourth place in the World Cup standings. A very strong runner, but out in front, Benjamin Sanson of France. In second, Lorandi after the swim. Third is Smith, Bevan is fourth, and the Russian, Fyodor Filipov, is fifth. Well, we're seeing the chasing group now. You must remember it's a no-drafting race. The World Championships are no-drafting race, and we're going to see the athletes in the chasing pack taking avoiding tactics, I'm sure. Benjamin Sanson leads, and he had that 30-second-plus gap after the swim. But if you remember at Ixtapa, this is where Spencer Smith showed his awesome strength on the bike. He's riding a new bike. He's actually broken 13 bike bicycle frames this year, and he's finally found the one that suits him. We're going to be seeing Smith coming up soon, as I'm sure we will with Bevan. But at the moment, Sanson leads by 30 seconds. They're approaching the motorway. They're going to be up and down that four times, and then the race is really going to develop into a cat-and-mouse tactical play. Second place man at the moment is Britain's Spencer Smith, defending world champion, going for two in a row here. But he's got a little bit of work to do at the moment. And behind Spencer Smith is Australia's Brad Bevan, the World Cup champion. These two, the very best in the sport, in the men's category at the moment. But this man still leads, Benjamin Sanson of France. Now, the women are in the water getting ready for their start. That's Sonia Krollig of Germany, very strong and a threat. There's Jenny Rose, the World Cup leader, going for the World Cup title here today. And Rena Bradshaw, who we saw at the beginning of the season, in excellent form, the Australian. There's Spencer Smith, currently in second. Bevan's behind him, and both of these are going in the hunt for Benjamin Sanson. There's the gap. You can see the two motorcycles between Sanson and Smith, and then just behind Smith is Brad Bevan. One of these two, Smith or Bevan, will be closing down. Back at the women's start. Well, the conditions are getting worse and worse here, and just as the women go away, we can uh, really see the ways beginning to develop. It's going to be a hard swim for Sonia Prolick. She won the European Senior Championship this year. She was fourth at the Worlds last year, and she actually won the World Junior three times. But she's a self-confessed -conf poor swimmer, and these conditions are going to be tough for Sonia. We'll have to see how she gets on. Back on the men's field, Sandstone still has that lead, but it looks to me as if Spencer Smith, who we can see there chasing hard, is pushing an enormous gear, looking at the cadence. Sabina Vestoff is the leader in the water for the women. She's also in second place in the World Cup standing, so there's a battle going on today between her and Jenny Rose for the title of the ITU World Cup champion for 1994. Could go either way. Sabina, on paper, is the strongest swimmer, and she's proving that here. She leads the women's field as they approach the turn. Well, we've got Dominic Donner, the South African, in second place, and she's a specialist swimmer, first time in the sport this year. Smith is alongside Sanson, and he's about to take him. Yes, indeed. Now, we thought this would happen, but it's happened a lot quicker than expected. Smith has powered past the Frenchman. Remember, the Frenchman swam in 17 minutes and nine seconds, and Smith was some 40 seconds or so behind, and he's caught that up, and he's overtaken him. Back on the women's swim, it's still Vestoff from Germany, leading through round that first boy. Back on the men's field, it's Smith, and he really is pushing such a big gear. Sanson trying to get back on terms, but Smith's moving away. Yeah, Sanson's having a go, but Smith is such an animal on the bike, there's no way he's going to let the Frenchman come past him. Well, back on the women's field, we've still got uh, Sabine Vestoff leading, but she's gradually being hauled in now, it seems, by a group which we know includes Dominique Donner from South Africa, Nina Anisimova from Russia, and also Rena Bradshaw, who we saw featuring so highly early on this season. They are beginning to pull her in now after that early lead from Germany's Vestoff. And this is Sabina Vestoff, the leader in the women's race. She's been absent from the World Cup Tour for the past two or three races, which have been dominated by Jenny Rose, the New Zealander. And Jenny Rose has now moved into first position in the ITU World Cup standings. So it's going to be decided here today, 
the title for 1994. Well, we just saw Jenny Rose there on the swim, but uh, back on the bike section, and it's Spencer Smith now. He's moving away from Benjamin Sansor, and Spencer's going to be in a position to see just how close his chasers are getting to him. Well, he's just seen Brad Bevan going up, and that's already 10 seconds that Spencer has, pushing this very, very big gear still. It was 55.11. We spoke about it at Starper, where he tried to get away from the pack. That was a drafting race, of course. This one isn't. But uh, just in the background there, as they're going back up the motorway with Spencer already on his homeward descent, we're seeing these packs begin to form, and it's such a shame if the marshals don't get in amongst them and try and break them up. There's Wes Hobson, he's in the chasing pack. Wes, a good cyclist, a good swimmer. Um, his running is what's led him down over the season. He did win the opening race of the year in a match of Japan. Let's see what he can do today. But he is up against the very best in the world, Hobson of the United States. There is a downside to this pack riding. The uh, athletes get in, they're very loose. And it's almost as if they're lulled into a sense of security. And if they're not careful, Spencer's going to be able to break away from them before they realise it. He's focused, isn't he, Spencer Smith? Look at the determination on his face. Concentrating 100%. He only has one thing in his mind, and that's to win this world title. And he started off very positively indeed. Back at the women's swim. Well, back at the women's swim, and we can see the difference taking place now. The early leader being caught by that chasing pack of three. And Dominic Donner of South Africa taking the lead. She's a specialist swimmer. I was talking to a coach uh, before the race, and he says uh, he expected her to be up here, but it's her running which is almost certainly going to let her down. Something they need to look at over the winter. Back on the men's race, here is the men's leader, Great Britain's Spencer Smith, the 1993 world champion from Manchester, now leading the pack here in Wellington, and he's going for two out of two, and it's looking reasonably good at this stage, but behind him is Brad Bevan of Australia, and it's Bevan who poses the most serious threat to Spencer Smith's title challenge. He's currently in third, and he's now hunting down Benjamin Sanson of France, and I'm sure it won't be long before Bevan moves into second. Bevan is in quite startling form this year. He's won six races on the ITU circuit. The question is, has he overdone it this season? Smith has had a different build-up. He hasn't raced quite so much. And some people are saying that Bevan has just overdone it in terms of the amount of races he's run and, in fact, the amount of races he's won. Here's the leader in the tunnel, Spencer Smith of Great Britain. Well, I just think that Spencer's moving away from anybody. It's, it's just completely riding his own race. He's not concerned about the people behind him. They're trying to avoid the draft zone. They're trying to get out of each other's way, make sure they don't get two-footed by the marshals. Spencer's got none of these worries. All he has to concern himself with is just how much he can hurt, how hard he can push himself. He's got the wind behind him. Now, I don't think he's actually moved out of that enormous 55-11 at all. Sanson's still in second place, but he's going to be already having doubts as to whether he can hold that form from the swim. Smith, on this long climb now, still in the same gear, absolutely phenomenal that he can hold this. He's in the larger chainring, the 55. He's got 26-inch wheels, remember, which changes the gearing slightly. The first women are completing the swim and coming to transition for the first time. And the first woman out of the water is the South African, Dominique Donner. She overtook Sabina Vestoff. It'll be interesting to see how far Sabina is behind the South African now. First in through the timing station, and she's taking the wetsuit off as she runs towards the bike. The transition speed, all important, because she wants to get out on the bike as quickly as she can. There's Sarah Harrow of New Zealand on the right. An amazing swim from the youngster. Haven't seen anything of her on the ITU World Cup Tour, but the Kiwi supporters here will be delighted with her early form. Best off, we just saw, but ahead of her is Rena Bradshaw. Bradshaw now ahead of Best off. Let's see who else is coming out. There's Gail Lawrence coming out. Now, she's been a regular feature on the ITU Tour, the winner in Bahia, Brazil. Gail Lawrence, an excellent cyclist, and this will be where she'll shine on the next stage. Uh, Gail Lawrence, we know, had a few medical problems coming into this race, an upset stomach, and she wasn't too sure about how much she'd be able to hold it during through the race. But uh, I'm sure she's going to be delighted to be up there on the swim. There's Rena Bradshaw leaving transition in third place. Bradshaw, the winner of the opening two races. And there's Emma Carney of Australia, whose sister has already won the junior race this morning. And Emma Carney's swim time is extraordinary. That's one of the best swim times she's ever achieved. Tenth place for her. She leaves transition. And only just behind Sarah Harrow, who beat her by four and a half minutes just recently. Her swimming really has improved. So Emma Carney is a force to be reckoned with in this world championship. There's Gail Lawrence. She leaves transition in eighth position after the swim. Good swim 
from Gale. Annette Pedersen of Denmark arriving. She gets out of the water in 15th position after the swim. There's Jenny Rose, World Cup leader, 23rd after the swim. So a little bit of work to do for Rose. Remember, she goes in search of the World Cup title in this race, so she needs to make up some ground here. Donna Dominique of the Republic of South Africa is first out of the water, ahead of the Russian, Alyssa Moba, Rena Bradshaw third, then Vestoff, then Anne Keat of New Zealand. And still no sign of two of the favourites, Karen Smyers and Sonia Kronick. They're yet to appear from the swim. The man at the top of the long climb on Brooklyn Hill is Spencer Smith, now completely in control of the men's race. He's got no one within sight of him. Benjamin Sanson is still in second, but Bevan is right with him. You can see Bevan just behind him and closing fast, the Australian. Spencer's put 40 seconds into the field in uh, less than halfway through the bike ride. He really has gone away. We knew he was going to go from the front. He's really made his play, and he's just absolutely dominating this race. And with Martin there beginning to move through, and we've still got that pack situation. But a glance behind there, are they going to catch him, are they not? What's he going to do? What's going to be his tactics in the race? Is he going to try and stay out there, or will he be content to get back in the pack? Brad Bevan of Australia still in third place, the most consistent triathlete on the tour this year, and indeed for the last three years, but still without that world championship title. OK, now, so there's no surprises on the men's race. Two of our top favourites, Spencer Smith and Brad Bevan, led right from the start. But by the kilometre 10, Spencer Smith had a 50-second lead on Brad Bevan. Bevan is about to be swallowed up by a chasing pack of over 30 guys. We've seen the draft busters out here and there have been a few calls, but I think it's going to be pretty tough to separate so many guys on such a fast course. In the thick of the action, and this is the pack to which she was referring, and at the moment there's no sign of Miles Stewart, the Australian former world champion, there's no sign of Hamish Carter, the New Zealand number one, or Rick Wells. We appear to have lost those three. We'll try and bring you news of their progress a little bit later. So back on this chasing pack, it's uh, Brad Bevan there. Sanson, who's just been reeled in, he's in third place. And then Scott Molina, one of the original big four from the USA. A long descent now, four kilometres, they're down to the sea. And they're not going to be able to take uh, Spencer Smith on this section. There's going to be a left turn at the bottom, then they're fighting into the wind again, which Spencer's already demonstrated his strength. Meanwhile, back in transition, that's uh, Sonia Krolik there. Poor Sonia Krolik, she looks to be suffering. Looks very, very cold there with the German coach. And she's finished the swim, but she's had to withdraw. And I'm sure we'll have the medical team looking at her now. So the race is over for Kronig, but it's just beginning for Rena Bradshaw and Sabina Vestoff here. Bradshaw on the right of your screen for Australia, and Vestoff playing a little bit of cat and mouse on the bike. Vestoff makes a move ahead of the Australian. We've seen this before in the opening part of the season. Vestoff and Bradshaw battling it out. There's Emma Carney, the Australian. She's coming through well. Sensational swim time from Emma moving up through the field. Out at the front of the women's field, Sabina Vestoff of Germany settling down. And the women are at the five kilometre point. The men are halfway through their bike section. Here's Emma Carney of Australia, and she's powering through the field. She's coming up alongside Sabina Vestoff and is about to take her. This is extraordinary. We've seen nothing at all of Emma Carney on the ITU World Cup Tour this year, but she's putting in a spirited performance here. She's overtaken Vestoff. Vestoff's coming back at her, and Vestoff herself must be thinking, who on earth is this in the Australian kit? Because it's not Rena Bradshaw. It's someone unknown, or relatively unknown, to the top Europeans. Emma Carney and Sabina Vestoff leading the women's field. Well, Emma Carney's really just dabbled in triathlon in the past. She had a, a big bid to make the Australian team for the Commonwealth Games this year, over 3,000 metres. She didn't quite make the team, she's left that, now she's really working hard. Gail Lawrence, who we knew was having problems before the race, actually in seventh place overall. She's third in, oh my goodness me, and we've got a crash there on the women's field. It's Sabina Vestov, Vestov is off her bike and on the tarmac, and Emma Carney takes full advantage and pulls away. I'm not sure if she's even aware of the mishap that's befallen Sabina Vestov behind her, but Carney has now a gap of 20 or 30 metres, and Sabina Vestov is back on her bike and back in the race, but with an impossible job to do because she came to a complete stop. Unfortunate circumstances. There's Spencer Smith. He leads the men's race still comfortably, and now we have a comfortable leader in the women's race, Australia's Emma Carney. Well, Emma may be inexperienced in triathlon terms, but she was certainly uh, on top of her wits there to avoid that crash. Could have been a tragedy for her as well. So on this flat section, halfway through the cycle course, 
and uh, we're getting an indication of just how big this lead is. My goodness me, what's happening here? Spencer Smith, I don't really think he's moved out of this gear at all. The cadence is so slow, you have to be tremendously strong to be able to control the bike like this. Now these three are racing on their own and battling it out for second place. Scott Molina, Brad Bevan, who looked like he may be swallowed up but has held off the challenge, and Benjamin Sanson, the leader after the swim, are racing together. And behind them, there's a Rainer Muller, the German, leads the second chasing group. But these three are clear of them and they're fighting it out for second. Bevan, Molina and Sanson. There's Sarah Harrow, the New Zealander, has moved alongside Emma Carney, the Australian. A superb challenge from Sarah Harrow, who's being lifted by the New Zealand crowd. She's a second streamer, really. She's by no means New Zealand's top women triathlete. That position belongs at the moment to Jenny Rose, but it's Harrow who leads the world championships. Extraordinary stuff from her, Steve. Uh, she's really racing well. She was, of course, world junior champion last year, and although she's not had the benefit of the experience on the ITU World Cup series, she is going to be good in the future. We're back on the men's field. We're up this long, difficult slope now, coming away from the sea. They're heading back into Wellington, the town itself. And we've still got Spencer in splendid isolation. We saw him do this at Manchester last year, where he just swum, cycled and ran away from the field. He's doing exactly the same here. He's in a world of his own, he's in a race of his own, and quite honestly, he's in a class of his own. Sarah Harrow's leading the women's field, and what a lift she's going to get from that. She's just 20 years old, this girl. She's coached by John Hellman, who won the Masters section earlier on this morning by an incredible five minutes, and that's going to give her a lot of confidence, knowing she's doing the right things. Here's the leader in the men's race, and the question now must be, can anyone get near Spencer Smith? He's led from just after the first changeover from the swim to the bike, and he's just accelerated and pulled away. The gap is enormous now, and Smith shows no signs of letting up the pressure. He's focused, he's gritting his teeth, and he's just powering away. We've barely even seen him out of the saddle. His fitness is at an all-time high. And Sarah Harrow on the hill displaying that her fitness is really tremendous as well. She's gone right past Emma Carney, who's desperately trying to get back to keeping contention. Emma, of course, the better runner of these two, but Sarah on home territory with everything to go for. And a man with absolutely everything to go for. He's still pushing this gear. He's out of the saddle, possibly for the second or third time only. He's not too far away from the transition now, just looking behind and checking. He's got this final motorway section. He'll be back down to the harbour, and he's going to be greeted by tens of thousands of people cheering through. Here we've got the chasing group. They're determined not to let him get away, but I don't think that they're going to be able to catch him now. Yeah, Spencer Smith is in full control of the 94 World Championships. He had a look over his shoulder a while back, but there was nothing to look at. There's no one there. He is racing entirely on his own. Smith, the Briton who won in Manchester last year, looks fairly comfortable to make it two out of two. Well, that uh, second pack, the small pack of three, seems to have been swallowed up now, and they're all going to be in contention. Maybe not for the gold medal, but for the silver medal. And what a fight we've got on here, the Australian and the New Zealander. Emma Carney has pulled her way and fought her way back to the front of the field, past Sarah Harrow. And who'd have thought it? The form book would never have suggested that these two would be leading the race. Now, let's have a look between Smith and the chasing pack. The clock on the bottom left of your screen telling us the advantage that Smith has, and it's enormous. Smith with over a minute lead there, and there's not too far to go on this fight now. They're more than two-thirds of the way through, and it really seems to me as if this pack isn't making an effort. Surely they must be. Surely it's the most important race in the world. They're just cruising along. Let's hear what Catherine has to say. I don't want to make any predictions, but Spencer Smith has a one-minute lead on the field. He's doing what he does best now. He's got 20 kilometers of flat, windy course to go, and he's pushing a big gear, and he knows he's got it in the bag if he can keep up on the run. One minute behind them, we have all the favorites grouped together, 15 men all together. They're pretty close. It looks like there's a lot of drafting going on, but there's not much they can do. The road's narrow, and there's a lot of them together. I think what they're doing is just staying together because they know that the guy who gets off the bike with the freshest legs can race for second place. Thank you, Catherine. Now, the thing that occurs to me is the drafting law has gone completely out of the window. How can they possibly enforce or judge the drafting law here? Emma Carney is the leader in the women's race. She's pulled away now from the New Zealander, Sarah Harrow, and she's going quicker and quicker and accelerating and opening up 
and an even greater grab. Her teammate, Rena Bradshaw, uh, is dropping back and is now in ninth. And that's Gail Lawrence, the winner in Bahia, Brazil. The back of the lead, Emma Carney there, she really put it to the rest of the field on the difficult ascent. She's a very, very light girl, very lightly boned, obviously from her running background. Here's a man who's very big boned and very big in the talent department, Spencer Smith, still going further and further away. He's on this final section of motorway. He'll be coming down the slight incline now, and then he's going to be greeted by this enormous crowd again. Nobody has successfully defended a man's senior world title. We could be seeing it here today. Smith takes the time to get some liquid down him, throws away his water bottle just to give himself a little bit less weight on the bike, a tiny amount of difference that'll make, but it's all important. Well, we've got a new second placer here, and here's a man who's taken advantage of that pack playing cat and mouse, Thomas Kochar from the Czech Republic in an unexpected second place. The pack round the turn. This is where we saw Sabina Vestov crash earlier, and there's a danger of that happening here with so many men's groups so tightly together. Again, you have to question the whole drafting law. It looks no different to the races where drafting has been legal. Here's Sabina Vestov, 12th place now. Remember, she crashed out. There appears to be no major damage to Sabina, but possibly mechanical trouble. Yeah, she's certainly not getting the cadence from the bike there that you would expect from her. Mechanical problems are hampering Sabina Vestov's challenge. Meanwhile, at the front of the field, Emma Carney of Australia is in control and looking comfortable and relaxed and focused. Well, Emma Carney, she's on this uh, very short flat section down by the sea. She's got another climb. And meanwhile, on the men's, we've got Scott Molina, one of the original greats in triathlon. And he's back in the big time. He's having a tremendous race now. He's moving past that group, just trying to break up slightly. He's a good runner, maybe not the best, but he's certainly in contention. Emma Carney leading the women's field. And what a day this would be for the Carney family if Emma could hold this on until the end of the race because her sister won the women's junior race earlier. And Spencer Smith is approaching transition for the final leg. Here he is, Smith along the harbour to the roar of the crowd. He's got over a minute's advantage. His feet are already out of the shoes attached to his pedals and he slowly comes to a halt off the bike and doesn't even stop. The momentum keeps going and Smith fairly sprints into the transition area. What a performance. This, providing he gets it right from here on in, looks like it could be the perfect transition. This is the leader, Spencer Smith of Great Britain the defending world champion with 10 kilometers to go to successfully defend his title. On with the running shoes. One of the officials just pointing out that he hasn't put his bike in exactly the right place. That won't cost him too much time. Away he goes. Spencer Smith powers out of transition. 10 kilometers between him and the 94 world title. What an athlete. What an athlete indeed. And what a trade-off he's got to think about. But uh, Thomas Kochar from the Czech Republic in an unexpected second place. He's not the strongest runner, Thomas, but he's in the position now with uh, a few seconds advantage. Here they come. All the favourites coming through. Brad Bevan from Australia. He's the man to fear. He's been duelling with Philippe Pettori from France throughout the ITU World Cup series. And he's going to be the man, if there is one, who can catch Spencer Smith. I don't think he can do it, but he's the man with the strength who possibly can. Nearly two minutes now is the gap between Smith and Bevan. Bevan is the stronger runner. He's lighter and he's got a better sprint finish than the Briton. But even Brad Bevan surely can't make up two minutes. The men continue to arrive. There's Philippe Pettori in. He's a strong runner too. Mark Bates, the Canadian, ran very well in Whistler. Sanson, the man who led after the swim, in at the same time as his teammate Pettori. A lot of people rate Philippe Pettori's running very highly, alongside that of Brad Bevan. And the atmosphere here in transition is extraordinary. Pettori makes his way out, 15th place. Smith leads, Kachar second, Bevan third, Bennett fourth, and Ralph Eggert of Germany fifth. That's the one to five after the bike. The world's in flowers. OK, here he is, the big man in all senses of the world. He looks to be struggling on the run, but I think that's just the powerhouse of the man, the size of his muscles. He's absolutely eating up that ground. Emma Carney coming through. She's dominated this cycle section. She's a runner, and she's winning the ITU World Championships. She's got a long, long gap before the chase. In fact, remember, last year's junior winner, the last time we saw her was in second place, Sarah Harrow. 
but uh, I can't see anyone taking Emma Carney. She's by far the fastest 10k runner in the whole women's field, and it's going to be a tremendous day, a junior and senior double for one family. Brad Bevan going through now, he's passed Thomas Kochar, he's moved into second place, he's got to give everything, a long way down on Spencer, but the only man in the field, with the exception of Pretori, who was even further down, who could catch this, the defending world champion, Spencer Smith. Back at the women's race, let's have a look at the timing between the leader, Emma Carney, and the chasing group. It's 40 seconds, so it's not an insurmountable distance. Interesting that a year ago, they said that Emma Carney couldn't swim to save herself. Well, she's proved that dedication and training can change things because she swam well and she's in control of this race. Ralph Eggert now from Germany. He's also moving past Thomas Kochar, so we've got uh, Ralph Eggert in third place. He's a good, strong triathlete, Eggert. He hasn't got a specialist discipline. He's strong overall. He's the man who's the strongest of all in the whole world. Spencer Smith, second there, Brad Bevan. And he's again moving away from that 3-4-5, some 15 seconds gap perhaps. But leading and looking stronger and stronger, Spencer Smith. And you can see the different style of Spencer Smith and Brad Bevan. Brad much lighter on his feet. He's a lighter man. And that gives him the advantage in the running section. But surely he can't make up two minutes, which is huge margin over 10 kilometers. Okay, this uh, pack now going for third place. First time he's seen Dennis Luce from the Netherlands. He's had a very consistent season on the European circuit. But yet Eggert now beginning to move away. Bennett chasing him hard, but uh, a big man who's not altogether happy on the run. Sarah Harrow looking very, very happy on the bike. She's chasing through on Emma Carney, but still a big, big gap to make up for her. 40 seconds was the gap the last time we checked. Emma Carney is leading. Sarah Harrow is second, this lady, Annette Pedersen, is in third, the Dane. We've seen great stuff from Annette on the European circuit so, uh, in the past. Now she's performing well on the world stage. But this young lady, Emma Carney, leads the women's race. Who'd have thought it? The form book would never have suggested that it would be Carney, Harrow, Pedersen, the one, two, three. But that's the way it stands as they approach transition. Well, here comes Spencer Smith now. He's heading back. He's made that first turn. He's going to be getting huge support from the crowds here. Everybody knows Spencer Smith on the circuit. There's a large amount of Brits out here. They raced earlier, but look at the cadence of this man, Brad Bevan. Brad Bevan, who was almost two minutes behind on that final transition, but with every single stride, does seem to be making inroads into Spencer's lead. Ralph Feggert still in third place, and again, another man who possibly a surprise here. Dennis Luce in fourth, and Dennis Luce moving away from Bennett the Australian. Here comes Spencer now, he's got this uh, double turn on the course, and this is where he's going to meet the big, big Brit crowds for the first time. Spencer Smith of Great Britain leads the World Championship. This is a man who's in unfamiliar territory in second place. In every race that he's won this year, Brad Bevan has come into transition, leading, and he's now got to close down someone ahead of him. Leading the women's race still, Emma Carney of Australia. In second place is Sarah Harrow, and in third is Annette Pedersen of Denmark. That's the one, two, three in the women's race. Further down the field, there's Karen Smyers coming through. An awful long way back. Smith comes into the harbour area. He's got another five kilometres to run after this, and he's encouraging the crowd to get behind him. Come on, I'm leading this race, he says. I'm going to be the world champion, and it looks for sure as if he is. Spencer Smith of Great Britain looking unbeatable at this stage. But don't discount Brad Bevan. He's a very strong runner. He's the World Cup champion, and he's lighter on his feet than the Englishman, and he's flying through the streets of Wellington here. Well, these two guys have taken the rest of the field apart there, both of them drawing the energy from the crowd. Spencer almost physically doing, lifting, willing, telling the crowd they have to support him. He's the man they've got to cheer and support. And Brad Bevan, the guy from Australia, the near neighbour who's chasing down hard, Spencer's just seen him as they've gone through, and he knows that, barring accidents, he's going to take his second world title. Karen Smyers there, 16th place now. She's four minutes behind the leader. Karen didn't look altogether happy on the swim and she's not been able to make up that gap. Quick glimpse of Mark Bates, the Canadian, who broke his wrist training in San Sebastian in Spain, back for his first major race since that injury. Here's Brad Bevan in second place and Bevan with the task of closing down the leader, this man, number one, wearing the number one vest, which he demanded to wear as defending champion and the ITU rightfully gave him the number one vest. Spencer Smith surely on his way to the title. Bevan looks set for second, but there, there is still a chance. It's a remote chance, but there is still a chance that Bevan can close him down. If anyone deserves a world championship, I have to say, it's Brad Bevan. 
Well, Bates has caught Eggert there, and uh, they're going for the last of the medal. So they're probably in a worse position than either Spencer or Brad. They need the medal. Spencer in gold medal position. Brad Bevan in silver. He's still catching up. It's a long, long way to go. And then that duel for the bronze medal between Eggert and Bates. The last turn now for Spencer Smith. Two and a half kilometres to go. He's going to be looking out. We're going to get a time check for you. And now we'll get the, the idea of the difference between Spencer Smith and Brad Bevan because Smith will pass Bevan going the other way. Keep your eyes on the clock. There's Emma Carney approaching transition, the leader in the women's race. Way, way ahead of the rest of the field now, the Australian, who's an exceptionally strong runner, looks as sure as Smith did coming into transition for the title. Bevan and Smith cross. Smith heading towards home. Bevan still coming out towards the final turn. You can see the difference in the styles. And that's the way it looks like it'll finish the one, two. It's not over yet, though. Into transition comes young Emma Carney to hang up her bike and head out on the 10-kilometer stretch to round off her 94 World Championship challenge. Well, Emma Carney with a long, long lead. Just as Spencer Smith ticking over now to a minute. Bevan approaching this final turn. Surely he must know that the chase has been in vain. Nobody can catch Spencer with less than two miles to go and 65 seconds behind. A lady with almost the same lead as Spencer had there, Emma Carney, the trialist for the Australian team, Commonwealth Games, over 10,000 metres. Best of the disciplines now, the 20-year-old Sarah Harrow from New Zealand in second place. She doesn't like running. She's not happy on it. She's improved tremendously, but the junior to senior transition is very, very difficult. This is Sabina Vestoff way, way down the field. And as well as seeing her World Championship title chances slip away, her quest for the World Cup title has also disappeared. Annette Pedersen in transition in third place and close to Sarah Harrow. These two will be fighting it out for second and third place over the 10-kilometer run. Pedersen, on paper, the stronger runner than Sarah Harrow, but Sarah Harrow is has the advantage of having the home crowd behind her. Emma Carney on her way out of transition. She leads Sarah Harrow, Pedersen is third, and Keith, another New Zealander, is fourth, and Jenny Rose, World Cup leader, is fifth. Runner, she's got it in hand. Another tremendous runner, another tremendous triathlete, the best in the world, Spencer Smith, just disappearing from your screen. Back on screen now, Spencer. All the acknowledgement from the crowd, the acknowledgement from his fellow competitors, they've got a long way to go still. Spencer's almost home, and there's his father, Bill Smith. Bill Smith, who manages and travels with him, encouraging Spencer for these last few strides. He's girding himself for the finish now. He knows he's got it sewn up. Nobody can take him. There's a man who's trying to, but it even seems that Brad Bevan has decided perhaps not. The guys who are going to be dueling for third place, Ralph Egger, he's motivating himself. He's willing himself on Mark Bates from Canada, and there's Dennis Luce from the Netherlands, the other man in the top five. There's Andrew McMartin, the other Canadian who's had a brilliant season, the winner of the Whistler stop on the ITU Tour. But here's the man who's about to win, surely now, the 1994 ITU World Triathlon Championship. He picks up the Union flag and makes his final burst for home, checks over his shoulder. There's no danger of Bevan catching him now. Spencer Smith is in sight of making it both 1993 as world champion and now 1994. The crowd saluting his superb, breathtaking performance whereby he's led from almost the start to the very end. Brad Bevan is in second. He too acknowledges the support and the generous applause from the crowd. Maybe it's just been a race too long this season for Bevan. Maybe he's just overdone it. There's nothing you can take away from his performance on the ITU World Cup Series, but for the big one, this man has come through. Spencer Smith of Great Britain. The finish line is within sight. He's just got to cruise home. The roar from the crowd is almost deafening here. There's about 100,000 out in every vantage point. Spencer Smith of Great Britain becomes the 94 World Champion. An absolutely fantastic race. The only man who's done it, he's doubled. He's also the world junior champion from two years ago, remember. He made that difficult transition. He had a poor start to the season, the first man to acknowledge that. And now he's acknowledging the cheers from the crowd. He is going to be so proud, so pleased. 
And we know the man who's going to be almost as pleased along with him, Bill Smith, the man who supported him. He's seen him through the bad times, through the good times. And now coming in into second place, the Australian who's had such a fabulous season on the ITU World Cup Series. The most consistent man on the circuit, certainly. And these two athletes with great, great respect from each other, they're just going to fall into each other's arms, I'm sure, as Brad Bevan crosses the line in silver medal position. Bevan, the 94 ITU World Cup champion, comes home to silver medal position in the World Championships. The battle is not over for the bronze, though. Mark Bates and Ralph Beggett of Canada and Germany, respectively. It's a sprint finish for bronze. Eggert kicks away from the Canadian. There's nothing to choose between them. It's Eggert, the German, who just gets there a fraction of a second ahead of Mark Bates. He takes third place. Bevan looks on. He looks disappointed, but he can't surely be disappointed with his season performance. Here's Philippe Vittori, a great run yet again from the Frenchman. We've seen him battle it out with Bevan on several occasions this year, and an excellent fifth place for Philippe Vittori. Vittori moving up from 15th at the end of the cycle. And the men's result, first, Spencer Smith, Great Britain, one hour, 51.04. Second, Brad Bevan, Australia. Eggert from Germany, third. Bates, Canada, fourth. And Philippe Vittori, fifth. Spencer Smith, you did it again. Two times world champion. Tell us how it happened out there. Well, you know, the uh, the bike course was to my advantage. It was a very tough day out there. The swim was very hard. The, the bike was even harder. It was so windy out there, but uh, I just managed to, to get away and uh, keep powering, and that was exactly what I managed to do. I mean, it was so hard and windy that uh, I think it was to my advantage. Uh, is there any special person that you attribute all this, this win to? Anyone who supported you out there the whole way through? Well, you know, it's been a, it's been a very hard year. It's been a very tough year. And uh, I've got to attribute most of that to my uh, to my father. And, father. Uh, hey. <laughs> and uh, I've got to say that about my mother as well. You know, it's been a very hard year for me. Uh, everything hasn't gone quite to plan, but uh, it's ended up okay. And uh, I'd like to thank all my friends and my family also. Thanks very much, Spencer. Thank Congratulations. Thank you. Congratulations, Bill. Thank you very much. Well, a delighted father and son combination and a very successful father and son combination. And it's a family affair, too, for the Carnies because sister Claire Carney has already won the women's junior title here at the World Championships today. And Emma Carney is on her way now, surely, to becoming the women's elite title. Back at the finish area, Brad Bevan is talking to Catherine Davis. I'd hate to uh, take it easy in the run and then just miss out at the end and, uh, you know, I'd, I'd live with it for the rest of my life. So I knew I, I wanted to give it 100% all the way and uh, had a fairly good run, but uh, my bike sort of let me down a little bit today. So you're more or less happy with what you've done today. You'd like to be first, but second's OK? Yeah, bridesmaid, never the bride. Oh, well, next time. There's always next time. There's always next time. Maybe I'll win the Olympics. The likeable Brad Bevan, his day will come, of that there is no doubt. And it's this lady's day today here in Wellington. The World Championship title with insight for Emma Carney of Australia. The battle for second and third place continues with Annette Pedersen of Denmark moving closer and closer to Sarah Arrow, the New Zealander. The formality continued for Emma Carney as Pedersen eventually overtook the young New Zealander who was now hanging on for third place. Pedersen, who was sixth in the World Championships last year, now in sight of a silver medal. A little bit further down the field, Jenny Rose looked certain to become the 1994 ITU World Cup winner as Emma Carney made her way to victory and the finish line. Carney now comes into the final straight. The Australian support here is enormous. There are many, many Australians who have travelled over to watch this race and hundreds and hundreds of athletes who have been taking part. Emma Carney comes home. Perhaps a surprise, but no doubt worthy. Carney is the world champion for 1994. In second place behind her now is Pedersen the Dane. Perhaps of the two Danes taking part here, you'd have expected Nielsen to go better, but Pedersen has timed each stage beautifully and has moved ahead of Sarah Harrow comfortably. She too moves into the final finishing straight. She'll just round the last turn and then the silver medal will be in sight. Behind her, Sarah Harrow continues to hold off the challenge from behind. Pedersen is absolutely thrilled with her performance and well she might be. On the form book, you wouldn't have expected Pedersen to do well. 
However, a silver medal is hers. Pedersen comes home for second place in the World Championships. We'll take a look back, and Sarah Harrow should still be in third position, and on her own, she picks up two New Zealand flags. The roar from the crowd is deafening. They're occupying every single possible vantage point. The big surprise of the day. They were expecting great things from Carter and Rose, but it came in the form of a third place and a bronze medal for the youngster from Canterbury. Sarah Harrow, the bronze medal for New Zealand. An excellent performance from the youngster. Tremendous performance there for 20-year-old Sarah Harrow. Suzanne Nielsen sprints into fourth place just in front of the current long course world champion, Isabel Mouton from France. Confirmation then of the women's race. Carney the champion, ahead of Annette Pedersen of Denmark. Sarah Harrow keeps the New Zealand flags flying. And Jenny Rose helps her along. Back in seventh, she takes the World Cup title. I had to be really happy with how things went. And, um, you know, some pretty good athletes finished behind me today. And uh, some really, really good ones finished in front. You know, uh, the, the young brigade are coming through. And uh, they're going to be pretty hard to catch in the future. You know, the sport's looking good. Jenny Rose, the World Cup champion for 1994. A magnificent race here in Wellington. Let's see how some of the World Cup regulars got on. Wes Hobson, the winner in Amaxa, finished down in 16th place. The Whistler champion, Andrew McMartin of Canada, was 7th. For the women, Sabina Vestop, winner of two races this year, finished in 25th. And the winner in Bahia, Brazil, Gail Lawrence, finished in 11th. The World Cup season comes to a close here in magnificent Wellington. We've had a terrific season. We hope you've enjoyed it. From me, Matt Chilton, from Steve True, and from Catherine Davis, goodbye for now.